Again, thank you very much, Pastor Folger. It, it is a thrill to preach the Cleveland Baptist Church Missions Conference, especially this Sunday morning slot. It's uh, one that's greatly coveted, and I'm always happy when I can preach in my home church on Sunday morning. Does God answer when we pray for our missionaries? When the American missionary leaves his country and goes to the mission field, uh, eventually he's going to learn something. What he's going to learn is that God did not send him because of his capabilities. Many times we think that, uh, well, God is calling Americans to go out and to go to the mission field because Americans are so competent and we really know what we're doing and, and uh, we have good intelligence and good reasoning. And so, you know, the Lord has blessed the United States with good local churches and as such he's calling out those people to go to other countries. I believe a lot of what I've just said concerning Americans, and I think that's why the Lord has greatly blessed us here in America and in our churches. But the reality is American culture is somewhat distinct in this world. We are rugged individualists. We think about uh, our own responsibilities and our own rights and, and the way things should be going in our own personal lives. And the fact of the matter is the rest of the world, or to a large degree the rest of the world, is much more communal in his thinking. So when the American missionary grows up here and then goes off to that new culture, believe me, there is much adaptation that needs to take place. There's no question about that. And the longer that I've been out there on the field, the more I begin to realize that God isn't calling Americans to go to these other countries because the Americans are so competent. God is calling Americans to these countries because if in fact there is success in the ministry you can know for an absolute certainty that it's God because the American is so out of place there and you really begin to realize boy you know it's not a, a competence thing on our part it's God creating a circumstance whereby he can work and he can move in spite of that American missionary and when that success is there then people know <laughs> And well, it didn't have that much to do with that American. It must have an awful lot to do with God. And it's because of that that we really need, we as missionaries, we really need for God to give us people on the mission field that can come alongside of us and compensate for all those weaknesses that we have as American missionaries. And we first went to the Ivory Coast, as we mentioned, September 1995, and we worked in the city of Anyama and there. We, we spoke on Wednesday of the situation with the container and how God answered your prayers and getting that container out of port. And we went through that first term and we came home in 1998 for Morgan's uh, surgery, her heart surgery, and we took furlough at that time. And before leaving, we told you that in going back, we were going to finish 1999 in Anyama because we did not know what was going to happen with the Y2K circumstance. And uh, as such, we were going to stay with our colleagues in Anyama where we knew things and but as soon as that was over, we were going to move to Bezierville, and we were going to open a new church in the city of Bezierville. And so we asked for your prayers in that, and you prayed with us. And in January 15th of 2000, we moved from Anyama to Bezierville, and in June of that year, 2000, we opened the Fundamental Baptist Church of Bezierville, again, with your prayer support. And because of your prayers, God did give us the people that we needed. I think of a man named um, <clears throat> Jeremy Matondo, actually from Congo, Robert, Kinshasa. And uh, he had immigrated to the Ivory Coast and had already accepted Christ. In fact, his father had worked with Baptist missionaries in the Congo uh, in the Institute. And we met and, 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 and uh, you know, became friends very, very quickly. And Jeremy got into our church and started serving the Lord in our church. And when we had to evacuate uh, at the end of 2002, when, when the coup broke out in September of 2002, Jeremy was there. And he was able to continue working with that church. He had great music capability. He could read English. He could study for messages. He could give those messages in French to our people. And without him, our church would have suffered greatly during that time of our evacuation. I think of a guy named Abel Oji who was actually from Togo, but had immigrated as well to the Ivory Coast. In all the world, I don't think I know anyone with a more humble, Christ-like attitude than Abel. An amazing man who started the choir 
of the Bainsville Church and brought that choir to be such an excellent choir to this day, now serving as a deacon in the Bainsville Church. I think of Jules Seri, who came to our church, a, a very determined type of individual. He accepted Jesus Christ. He got up the next Sunday and said, I've done it, now you all ought to be doing it. Let's go, come on. He knew his marriage situation wasn't what it needed to be. He went to the city hall. He got all that squared away. The following Sunday, he got up and he said, I did it. You all can do it. If you want to know how, see me, and I hope you get it done. Uh, just move forward. And it was Siri that came up with the idea of the Literacy Center to reach Muslims. He's headed that ministry for, 21, for 20 years. And as well, he has headed up our village ministry, also a deacon in our church, financial secretary. I think of a lady named Pauline Conan. Pauline, one of the most appropriate women I think I've ever known. Pauline can correct me without anyone realizing that's just what she did. <laughs> if something is not right, Pauline's going to let me know, and nobody else is going to know that I didn't know that and that she helped me to know that. Such an amazingly appropriate woman, knew Christ, came into our church, joined the church, has, was so instrumental in helping our ladies. Uh, Pauline Conan, we would have had much difficulty without her. I think of a guy named Francis Sion, a little bit younger, came in just a little bit later after the starting of the church. An amazingly competent young man. Has his degree in petroleum, master's in petroleum, but just <laughs> there's just nothing available for him by way of work in the country. I think in the years to come, uh, he'll be very instrumental in some of the ministries that we're starting, whether the school, uh, the school or, or the medical clinic. Uh, but again, a man that can preach the word of God with integrity and lives it out in front of our people. I think of a guy named Guy Maurice, Guy Maurice Pai. His family fled Bangalore in 2002 because of the war. They had to walk 25 miles through the bush to get to Duakwe so they could get on a bus and get to Bangerville. And he arrives in Bangerville as a 12-year-old boy. Came to our church because he heard we gave out candy. Accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and grew in grace. When Guy Maurice was in college, I didn't know this, but... I, but when he was in college, I learned that when he was in high school and had to take the bus from Bangerville all the way to the other side of Abidjan to go to school every day, he would get on that bus in the morning. He'd get himself situated. He'd be the first one there. He'd get himself situated on that bus. And then they would proceed to pack about 100 students onto that 66-capacity bus. And it would leave Bangerville to head to school, about a 45-minute ride. And Guy would pull out his Bible, and he would read a Bible passage out loud, and then explain that passage out loud. And those students had no other option <laughs> but to sit there and listen to him do it. And he would do it all the way to school in the morning, and he would do it all the way home in the evening. Guy is, we believe, going to become the pastor of the Bangerville Church. He's in the midst of his institute training, straight-A average, excellent student, fervent for the Lord Jesus Christ. But you see, God gave us those people because of your prayers. You asked that God would be with us and that he would help us and that our works were flour would flourish. And God said, okay, that's exactly what we'll do. But he knows what our weaknesses are. He knows what my family's weaknesses are. So he answers your prayers in bringing in the people that we're going to need in order, so those, in order for those ministries to succeed. So does God answer when you pray for your missionaries? Absolutely. There's no question about it. This morning, let's go to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 19. And in this conference, we have been considering things that are complete. We saw complete warfare on Wednesday evening, and we recognize that spiritual warfare is something that takes place in our minds. And so we warned ourselves, as it were, to make sure that we don't have any preconceived ways of thinking going into this missions conference that are in fact contrary to the scriptures, that we would think correctly about our going and our praying and our giving. On Thursday evening, we came and we saw Christ's complete love, the love of Christ for us, as seen in the solution that Christ provides for our sin problem, and then the love of Christ through us, 
how we develop spiritually, and in that spiritual development, we get out as ambassadors for Christ, and the same love that brought us to salvation, we channel to others so that they as well can be saved. Friday, we took a look specifically at the aspect of giving, complete giving. If we're going to give effectively for the Lord Jesus Christ, then we have to recognize the principles that are there. We give of our whole self first. We give considering the need. We give remembering the sowing and reaping principle. We give recognizing that we should do it voluntarily with joy. Because why? Because it's all God's money anyway, and we're nothing more than managers of it. As we come to this morning's message, let's consider the idea of a complete proclamation. Now, when we're in Luke chapter 19, and we're going to look at a very familiar story starting in verse 28. Luke chapter 19, verse 28, the scriptures say, And when he, that is Jesus Christ, had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him, and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do ye loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto him, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that, if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even now, at the least, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Now as we read this story, again, my bet is that every one of you have heard this story before. You have studied it perhaps. Every year, the Sunday before we get to the Good Friday and Easter, we have what we refer to as Palm Sunday. Maybe you have some memories of growing up in Sunday school. I remember as a child, we did not attend a gospel preaching church, but we did go to church, and I remember learning the Sunday school stories. I can remember seeing the pictures of Jesus on, on the donkey and, you know, a couple of people around him, maybe a couple of palm fronds going, and maybe a couple of people putting their clothes out in the way as he went along. And sometimes as we look at this, we may not grasp the significance of this event. Especially considering, considering that just a few days later, we will have the crucifixion and the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And those three events by far are the most important events in human history. There has never been anything that has transpired on this earth more important than the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ at least from our perspective. And so maybe because of uh, the, the upcoming uh, celebration of Easter, we might minimize a little bit the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ, but I would like for us to understand this morning that this actually is a very significant event. Go with me, if you would, back into the Old Testament, to the book of Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 9, we see that the prophet Daniel, some 500 plus years in advance, prophesied concerning this event. Daniel chapter 9, we begin in verse 24, where Daniel is giving a prophecy concerning the chronology of God's program for the nation of Israel. And let's be clear, it is the nation of Israel of which he is speaking. 
He deals with this concept of weeks and recognizes that this word in the original is actually the word seven, so he's saying 77s. It's the word that the Hebrews used for the word week, but we recognize in the English structure we're very intent on a week being seven days, but we recognize in the context of this portion of Scripture that a week deals with seven years. So we read in verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. So again, this is a prophecy given to Daniel. 70 groups of seven years. This is God's program for the nation of Israel. We see that because upon thy people, that is Daniel's people, and Daniel was absolutely Jewish, and upon thy holy city, the holy city of Daniel would most obviously be the city of Jerusalem. So we have here God's program for the nation of Israel. And we see that it's going to be in this chronology of 70 weeks. We go to verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem until the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So here we have the beginning. The beginning is what? It is the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. Well, who is that? That is not Zerubbabel who went back to rebuild the temple. It is not Ezra, who went some 80 years later after Zerubbabel to go and dedicate the temple. This commandment to which Daniel is making reference here is speaking of Nehemiah, who is commanded to go back and to rebuild the walls and the city of Jerusalem. So Daniel put the word out decades in advance that when that commandment came down, and we see that it was to Nehemiah to go back to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem, that was the starting of God's program for the nation of Israel from that point, for, from that point on. And so in history, we saw Nehemiah as he returned, and we recognized that that started the 70 weeks. So we see that with Nehemiah, the clock starts running. He's to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem, and now we go under the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So we have a beginning, and that beginning is with Nehemiah. We then go seven weeks of years, something around 49 years. Most likely at that point in time, we're getting to the end of Malachi's ministry, his prophetic ministry, the last of the Old Testament prophets. We see that after those seven years, there's an additional 62 years for a total of 69 years. And we recognize the end of that 69th week with Messiah the Prince. We continue to read, and we, and we read in verse 26, and after three score and two weeks, and that includes as well the first seven weeks, for a total of 69, after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. Now that's the same Messiah, verse 25. But not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So again, what are we reading here? We're reading that we have the start with Nehemiah, we go seven weeks through the end of Malachi's ministry, an additional 69 weeks to the Messiah, the Prince. And there is a stopping place here because the scriptures say after the Messiah, the Prince, Jesus will be crucified and then the city of Jerusalem will be destroyed. And we've seen the completion of both those. The Lord Jesus Christ's crucifixion and the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. That is after the end of the 69th week. Now look with me in verse 27. And he... And without belaboring this point, taking too much time in this, he is, is, is referring back to verse 26, the prince with small p, which is a reference to the Antichrist. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. There we have our 70th week. So again, we have Nehemiah, seven, seven weeks getting us past Malachi, 62 weeks bringing us to the Messiah, the prince. After the Messiah, the Prince, the crucifixion, the destruction of Jerusalem, and then eventually somewhere beyond that point, we have the Antichrist making an alliance with Israel. That which has not happened yet. In fact, we recognize that we are still in this moment of time between the end of the 69th week and the beginning of the 70th week. That's where we are today. It's why we believe that the Lord's going to take us back before we get into, into the tribulation. Only logical that the Lord would finish what he's doing in this parentheses of time, this dispensation of grace, this era of the local church, that he would complete that and draw his church out and then return to his program with Israel 
in the 70th week, also known as the tribulation. Now you say, now, Brother Mac, what in the world does this have to do with the triumphal entry of, the, uh, of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem? It is because the vast majority of conservative scholarship believes that this reference to the Messiah, the Prince, is a distinct reference to the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. Daniel prophesied this event 500 plus years in advance. And he said this event, in fact, would indeed take place. So as Jesus now has come uh, into the Judean region, he stops in Jericho. He has his experience with Zacchaeus. He gives some more teaching. He moves on from there to Bethany and Bethany and, and begins making the plans for his return into Jerusalem. Recognize that he is fulfilling prophecy as he goes along. As Jesus is there on the Mount of Olives and that donkey is brought to him, this was amazingly significant to the Jewish people because they were aware of what Zechariah said in Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon the, a colt to the foal of an ass. The Jews knew this. Here's Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth that they'd heard about for three years, but they had not seen in quite a while because Jesus had been avoiding Jerusalem. The one that they had wondered after, is he going to deliver us from the Romans? Is he going to bring salvation to our nation? Now they hear that he is, he is there on the Mount of Olives, and this donkey has been brought, and they're preparing for him to enter into the city on that donkey that would not be lost to the Jewish people. Word would spread quickly of what was taking place. And if you've ever been to Jerusalem and you've looked from the Mount of Olives across to Jerusalem, you know that as you descend and go down into that ravine and work your way up to the city, there is a massive amount of space where numerous people could have come to see what was transpiring. As well, once the people begin moving, what are they saying? They're saying what we see written in verse 38. Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Well, is this just any praise that's being bestowed on Jesus Christ? It is not. In fact, the crowd is chanting what was written in the book of Psalms. Psalm 118, verses 25 to 29. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord. I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even under the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, and I will exalt thee. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. So as news of Jesus' arrival reaches the city and that animal is brought and Jesus is put on it and the crowds begin to chant Psalm 118, you can know for a certainty that there were thousands, perhaps tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people that are flocking to see what this is about. The city is already swelling with immigrants coming in for the Passover celebration. The city is full, and as that news spreads, you can imagine the people are coming to see what took place. And what is absolutely certain is that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ was very successfully proclaimed on that day. So let's look at this story, and let's see if there aren't some elements here that we can recognize. Because again, our objective in this missions conference is to proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ around the world even better, even more forcefully, with better effectiveness. So what transpired on this day from what we can learn to help us today? Well, one thing that I find very interesting in relation to this particular story is the preparation that was needed in order to proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ on this day. And what's interesting about it is that man had a role and God had a role. Now, if the Lord Jesus Christ wanted to, he could have materialized the donkey. Okay? He had that kind of power, and if he wanted to do that, boom, there it is. If he wanted to avoid something that spectacular, he simply could have had the animal come walking up while they were standing there. And, oh, here it is, let's use it. But that is not what he did. In fact, it was Jesus' intent 
that his disciples be involved in the preparation for the proclamation of his name. And so he used them. And what's really interesting in this context is not only did he use them to go get the donkey, he told them precisely how they needed to go about doing it. And that would be a lesson for us to continue to grasp today. Unfortunately, there is much done in churches today where the objective is correct, but the means of going about achieving it is unbiblical. Let's be clear that God tells us what to do and he gives us the principles for doing it correctly. Things like worship, evangelism. Yes, we can think of new ways, provided that they are biblical. But we ought not be so quick to shun the ways that God has blessed in the past. God gives this objective to the disciples. You need to get this donkey. He tells them how to do it. It's amazing. I don't know about you, but if I'd been one of those disciples... And here I am walking to Jerusalem with the other guys to get this talk for Jesus. You know, I, I would have been inclined to say something like, guys, I mean, I heard what Jesus said. You heard it too, but <laughs> you know nobody's just going to give up their donkey. Okay, that doesn't happen. Those things are expensive. I think we ought to go over to Avis or Hertz over here and rent us a donkey and take that back to Jesus because there's just no way somebody's going to give up their donkey like that. No, Christ told them how to do it, and the success in this event was partially due to the fact that the disciples were obedient and how to go about taking care of that preparation for the event. And God was faithful in his role. What did the men say? They told him they could take the donkey. If tomorrow morning you stick your head out the door and somebody's getting into your car and you say, hey, what are you doing? And they're saying, hey, God needs your car today. How many of you are going to throw him the keys? God prepared their hearts. Now, if you look at liberal scholarship, they're going to tell you, well, it's because Jesus went by earlier and made the arrangement with them. Well, the scriptures don't seem to indicate that. Jesus came down from Galilee, went through Jericho, and was up in the Bethphage and Bethany as we're beginning to start this event. No real opportunity seen there for him to make a previous arrangement. And so what if he did? It still is striking that somebody would give up an animal to two people that they've never known. And so we see the need for preparation. And again, that is what this missions conference is about. We are corporately uniting this week. <laughs> yes, through the internet. But still, corporately uniting this week to prepare for this upcoming missions year. We want that missions year 2021 be more productive, more fruitful, more effective than missions year 219, 220. And so we must recognize that when we speak of going and when we speak of praying and when we speak of giving, we're not simply speaking of these things to remind you. We are speaking of these things so you can sit down during this week and you can plan and you can prepare. You can determine what are we going to do in this area? Who am I going to target for evangelism? What am I going to do by way of distributing tracts? How am I going to pray during this time? What structure have I put into place for this? And yes, what am I going to give through the Faith Promise Program? A time of preparation. Preparation is crucial to effectively proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't happen by accident, per se, or haphazardly. So preparation. Number two, let's look at verse 39. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. Now again, as we're reading through this story and looking at what it's saying, that can seem somewhat minor to us. You know, you might even picture some lame guy, Master, rebuking your disciples. But again, let's go back to what we know. This was a prophesied event. This may well have been Messiah the Prince fulfilling Daniel's prophecy, fulfilling Zechariah's prophecy, fulfilling what was said in Psalm 118. We know that the Jewish people would have recognized this immediately and quickly and certainly would have been drawn to this. They were yearning to be saved from Roman domination. They were yearning to control themselves. They were yearning to, to, to restore things to as they had been during the Hasmonean dynasty, and they wanted Jesus to do this. Huge crowd. Now, could the Pharisees offer a lame rebuke in the midst of that? As news is spreading through Jerusalem of what's taking place, certainly news came to the Temple Mount, hey, this Jesus of Nazareth, you know, the one that we've already determined we need to kill? 
He's over there on the Mount of Olives doing the Zechariah thing. People are chanting Psalm 118 to him. He's coming down the mountain. He is heading towards Jerusalem. He's going to enter the city as a king in a time of peace. Certainly the Sanhedrin would have left quickly from the Temple Mount. Certainly they would have taken the Temple Guard with them, those same guards who will eventually arrest Christ in the garden. And in coming out of Jerusalem, they're not going to situate themselves in a position of weakness as Christ has to mount, as he has to ascend to get into Jerusalem. They're going to position themselves from a position of strength and with all of their authority, they're going to quiet the crowd and then they're going to say directly to Jesus, rebuke your disciples. It wasn't a lame persecution. It was a rather severe persecution on the part of the Sanhedrin. For them, this had to stop, and it had to stop immediately. Now, what can we learn from that? We can know and understand that if we proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that will as well be accompanied with persecution. Now, fortunately, in our country, it hasn't reached to the point where we're legally prosecuted, fortunately, up till this point. But, you know, we get mocked at work. Hey, the preacher's on time today. <laughs> or, you know, jokes, you know, making fun of us as we're at work because of positions that we hold, according to the scriptures. That's persecution. When we walk past a neighbor and we're getting ready to greet them, and just as we greet them, we see them turn their head and go the other way, and we know that they saw us, that's persecution, avoiding you because of what you believe, what you might talk about. So there's subtle persecution that's out there that we have to suffer. The slam door, not quite as subtle. But the reality is there are many areas in this world where Christians suffer greatly, where evangelism must be done so discreetly and so wisely because of the persecution that can come. But we recognize that that will be the case. Therefore, we do not allow that to impede us, to hinder us, to keep us from doing what we're supposed to be doing. As we sit down and we, pre we prepare to proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we do so knowing that that will be accompanied with a certain persecution somewhere, so we steal ourselves for that. And we prepare ourselves for that. So that we're not shocked, we're not hurt, we're not detoured for what we should be doing. There will always be those who mock our faithfulness. There will always be those who want to change our message in order to make it more pleasing to their ears. But we must always recognize that the devil fights against us using these people, using persecution. The Great Commission is a battle that always requires our greatest effort. And quite frankly, a message without persecution may well be a message without importance. If we're going to successfully proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must do it knowing that persecution will come. So we steal ourselves for that. We're ready. Thirdly, look with me in verse 41. Speaking of Jesus, this verse says, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Now again, as Jesus is approaching the city on this day, he is approaching it as a king, and he's being recognized as a king. He's being recognized as being a fulfillment of prophecy. It certainly is a great hour. The Pharisees have just tried to rebuke him, and, 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 and pardon the expression, but Jesus slapped them down pretty good, and, and we're not getting anything more out of them. But yet, as he looks at this city, he knows what's going to transpire in this city in just a few days. In just a few days, he will be arrested. His name will be smeared. He'll be mocked. He'll be spat upon. He'll be beaten. He'll be scourged. And eventually, he'll be nailed to the cross. And he knows that it is this city that's going to do that to him. But yet, he has such passion for it. He is weeping over it. And herein is another element that is extremely important in order to successfully proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is the passion that is necessary in order to do it. Jesus wept for his city. He wanted to see the salvation of his people. For him, this was not a small thing. And in spite of all the cheers and all the accolades that are taking place and the reciting of Psalm 118 as he looks at that city, 
He has nothing but passion for that city. Now, in all honesty, for me personally, this is perhaps the most difficult element. I myself, in my sinful nature, I do not have this type of passion. You know, if I'm at a party and I don't know anybody, eh, it's just fine. I can sit my punch in the corner. You do not need to feel like you have to come up and talk with me. I'm just fine. And, and I do not like to, 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 to reach out and to meet new people. Uh, I've got my program. I'm the type of guy, I just, I'm, I'm going to get done what I think I need to get done, and I'll enjoy myself with those with whom I choose. That's me in my sinful nature. Very easy for me to say, hey, if that city's going to do to Jesus what they're going to do, then they can just all die and go to hell. They'll certainly deserve it. That's what can come out of my fleshly nature. And so the reality is, in order for me to successfully proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I have to beg God to give me the necessary passion. Because as we're dealing with our sinful nature and as we're going through the difficulties of life, it is so easy to zoom out on the people. It is so easy to think only of what is right here in front of me rather than lifting up my eyes and looking across. I remember recently before coming home, I, we were in our institute building and we were looking out. We were up on the third floor. We were looking out over Bangerville and as I saw all the homes down there, I'm standing there thinking, man, look at the poverty. Guy, our, our future pastor, was standing right there next to me. I hadn't said a word. I'm just thinking, look at the poverty. And all of a sudden, Guy says, man, look at all the souls out there. He had a passion. He wants to reach them. And if we are going to successfully proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must as well have that kind of passion. Because, fourthly, as we see in verse 43 and 44, there is such peril awaiting. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, encompass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. And in fact, this did absolutely happen in Jerusalem. The city completely destroyed in 70 AD. The Romans came. To this day in Jerusalem, you can go and see the very stones of Herod's temple that were cast over the side of the Temple Mount and are lying there. Jerusalem completely destroyed. 70 AD, many took refuge on Masada, but three years later, the Romans made their way to the top of Masada. And instead of surrendering to the Romans, the Jews that were all on that mount in refuge had killed themselves. Such devastation, such peril that waited Jerusalem, and we see in history that peril take place. But again, as Christians today, we can recognize that there is a peril far worse than that that is waiting this lost and dying world. And if we don't recognize that peril that they are in, we cannot expect to have the passion that we need to reach out and to proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, in order to successfully proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must prepare. We must steel ourselves for the persecution that's coming. We must beg God to give us the passion that we need because we see the peril that is awaiting those who are lost and who die in that lost condition. But in conclusion this morning, let's consider as well the potential problem. Go with me to, to verse 40. In verse 40, Jesus answers the disciples, or excuse me, answers the, the Pharisees, and he says, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Now, again, if you want to, you can peruse through some liberal scholarship, and you might see something like, well, when Jesus is speaking here, he's using hyperbole. He is using an exaggerated expression. Certainly nobody was anticipating that the stones would ever cry out. Well, I beg to differ. Don't forget, this was prophesied hundreds of years in advance that Jesus Christ would come into Jerusalem 
on a donkey with Psalm 118 being proclaimed by the people. Psalm 118 was absolutely going to be proclaimed on that day. Absolutely essential to have, the fulfill, uh, to have fulfilled prophecy. There was no way that Christ could go into Jerusalem on that day without having those praises and, and, and Psalm 118 expressed as a part of his going in. Impossible. So if the people that were there on that day had shut their mouths and they had determined, we're going to listen to the Pharisees, we're not going to give these praises anymore, those praises would have absolutely come from somewhere. And God had already used the donkey once. So is it so ridiculous to assume that our almighty, all-powerful creator God of heaven would have brought those praises out of something as inanimate as the rocks, as the stones? It's entirely possible, given that he created them. He can make them do that which he wishes. But you see, here's the problem for us. Again, this particular day was a very specific day. These prophecies had to be fulfilled, very specific. We're not necessarily working as it, as it were today in such an exact circumstance. In other words, if we do not proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in a specific situation, we don't have the stones to back us up. If we don't proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in a specific circumstance, his name remains unproclaimed in that circumstance. And nothing's going to change that. So what's the potential problem? The potential problem is, do we want to find ourselves before God and hear him say, you know, I think I might have been better served to use the stones than to use you. And I don't think anyone that is truly born again could bear to stand before the Father and to hear that. I'd have been better off if I'd used the stones than to have used you. And so as we think this week about proclaiming the name of the Lord Jesus Christ around the world, we must think about what's necessary to do that. We must prepare. We must steel ourselves against the persecution. We must beg God for the passion necessary, recognizing the peril that is waiting those who die without accepting Jesus Christ. Because if we don't, if we just go through our lives, then it may well be what we hear that God would have been better served to use the stones than to use us.